we've got a great presentation going for you on Next Generation 911 Security. We're calling it the Next Generation of Emergency Phonage. Uh, myself, my name is Alex Kryline. Uh, I'm the CTO of SecureSet, a cybersecurity academy in Denver. I used to be a strategist with the Department of Homeland Security and a researcher with NIST. I'm also a level eight cyber wizard. That's me, this is my partner, Trey. I'm Trey Forgety, I'm the Director of Government Affairs, and uh, they, they call me the resident teenager at uh, the, uh, NINA, the 911 Association. He's got a uh, great face. We're the standards developer for uh, everything related to 911, so uh, when you get found, uh, when you call from a cell phone, we're the reason that's actually possible. Um, I, I'm also a former Presidential Management Fellow. Alex and I did very similar tours. I was at DHS, FCC, and TIA, kind of all over the federal government. Um, the reason that I'm still into like computers and security stuff in spite of being, and I'm going to use the official DEF CON term, a fucking lawyer. Fucking uh, lawyer. In spite of that, um, <laughs> the reason that I can still be into all this sort of stuff is because in addition to that, I'm a physicist and a navigator. So these are, are things that are technologies that are still very interesting and important to me and I kind of try to keep on top of stuff. Also a pirate. True story. Um, so a couple of opening shots uh, to we'll set the stage a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about some vulnerabilities in the way trust is implemented in uh, next generation 911, which we're going to tell you all the sort of background about first. Um, there's a really important reason that we're doing this. In the public safety community, we're very comfortable with not telling people things. Like, we, you know, everybody knows the police department, the fire department, they just love sharing information, right? Well, 911 is the same way. Um, the problem is in today's information security environment, that doesn't work. The only way you get stuff fixed is by talking about it and bringing people like you together to say, oh, okay, how can we poke at this and, and figure out how it works and break it and make it better. Um, so that's why we're doing this. And you know, we believe very passionately, our organization does, that uh, talking about vulnerabilities makes us stronger. And so we're gonna be doing that. Um, this October, we're actually doing the first 911 uh, cybersecurity conference. It'll be in Columbus, Ohio. It's gonna be really cool. Same reason I tell my dates I cry in my sleep. <laughs> So the, I, I'm going to talk a little bit in the first part of this, uh, a little bit of history. Um, and it's important to understand that today's 911, the 911 that you could use if you called right now, is it's called E911. That's a part of the telephone age. It's not a part of the computer age, and it's certainly not a part of the internet age. It really is a part of the telephone age. There are things here like time division multiplexing uh, and class 5 ESS switches that, that, that you just, like, people like us don't, ever want to see in our day jobs because that just means we're doing something wrong, right? But 911, that's all that it runs on. Um, and that has some consequences. So historically, trust in the public switch telephone network was this very sort of inherent thing. Um, you had relatively high confidence usually that the person you were calling was the person that you got because there was physical security of the trunks uh, running through conduits and overhead cable. The signaling was very obscure. Um, uh, until folks like uh, Captain Crunch, T Profit, and folks, the, the telefreaks, really got into uh, poking around with the network, um, things like medium frequency signaling and CAMO, which is centralized automated message accounting, which is no joke, a paper tape protocol invented in the 1950s, which is still used to connect 911 calls today. No joke, if you make a 911 call, it's probably being connected by a CAMO. And carrier pigeon. That too. <laughs> Um, you also had control plane segregation, legal protections, all these sorts of things, and that just meant that you didn't have to worry about things like certificates and authentication and cryptography and so forth. That, that just wasn't in the mindset, and it's still largely not in the mindset of public safety professionals. So back in the 1968, in 1960s, uh, the International Association of Fire Chiefs and ultimately a, a big thing called the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice um, got together and they really like imagined the public safety system of the future. Here, this is a report that was issued in, in about 1967, I think. Um, and in, in this report, they actually envisioned having 911, having computer aided dispatching, automatic vehicle location, and radios on every cop. That's pretty amazing at a time when like a radio was something that you could just barely fit in the trunk of a car. Um, so it, we've come a long way, and th this is kind of how we got there. So the fundamental problem that we're trying to solve with all of this stuff is um, who called us and where and with what? Those are important things. We need to know who needs help and how do we find them to get the help to them. And it's also important uh, for reasons that we'll talk about in a second to understand what they were calling with because um, the 911 system was part of the wireline world. Right? Telephones were these big heavy metal things that sat on tables that some nice man came and installed at your house. I've seen the videos. Um, the, 
That changed, though, in the 1980s when all of a sudden a, a, a phone could be a three-pound hunk of metal that you put in the floorboard of your car. And those no longer had convenient addresses. And then all of a sudden crazy people came along and started sending voice calls over this internet thing that nobody knew anything about. And we decided, okay, well, those should probably have access to 9112 because otherwise somebody's going to pick one up one day because, well, it looks like a telephone. And they're not going to get what they expect. So the world that all of this is designed for, just to kind of set the stage in your mind, in E911, the way it really works, um, you've got, uh, when, you, when you establish telephone service with a wireline phone, the phone company takes your address from you on the service order, and they validate it against this uh, maroon box called the Master Street Address Guide. It's a list of all the street names in a jurisdiction and all the correct address ranges. Um, they look it up in the fixed database, make sure that it's valid, and then they record it in that purple box, the Automatic Location Identification Database. And then at call time, when you, when you call in the selective router, that's just a class five telephone switch, it uses your phone number to dereference your address and send that to the 911 center over typically a, you know, these days they might be up to like, you know, 14.4 kilobit modems. And, and I'm, I'm really not exaggerating, that, that's true. A lot of these are, you know, old. Very modern infrastructure yeah, the, V90, for the Bundys. V92 is still out there. Um, and, and the great thing is, because of that now, we, you know, in the early days of 911, all of the, the people in a town, regardless of which was like the right 911 center, the right uh, police department in those days, um, all the calls went to one place, which was not great because um, you might be in the other part of the county that's actually served by the city. And so that's why this thing is called a selective router. It can also decide, hey, you're in Robertsville, not Alice Springs, send that to the other PSAP. PSAP is a public safety answering point. It's a fancy term for 911 center. And this is important because what we're going to be talking about, this same type of logical trust model, is what's bolted on to IP networks, right? So understanding that the phone company trusts the phone company because it's all the phone company is really important because we didn't change that even though it's not the phone company anymore. Yeah. That's where our exploitation is about to come in. The, the line we, we actually put on the conference CD is that uh, in, in the beginning the, the AT&T created the PSTN and the trust model was void and with out form. Hallelujah. Because they were the phone company, damn it. Can I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> so th there are some problems with keeping this kind of stuff around because if you do this, and this has been talked about at DEF CON before, um, static databases become vulnerable to spoofing. Um, if you can spoof the automatic number identification, then as provided you're sort of generally in the same jurisdiction as the, the 911 center you want to target, you can get a call to look like it's coming from someone else. Um, and these sorts of things have been used in like swatting attacks um, to, to basically convince a 911 center that in fact this is Brian Krebs, for example, calling 911. Which happened. Actually not. Um, spoofing Annie automatically spoofs Allie. This is a terrible, horrible, miserably unethical thing to do, and we strongly encourage you not to because it makes you a terrible human being. Um, the thing is, in, in the, the PSTN world, there is no uh, flag to say, hey, this looks kind of suspicious, maybe treat it differently, right? Um, and all of this legacy equipment is getting really expensive. Everything is going over the top. Uh, people want to communicate with RTT and videos and pictures and electronic medical records and all this stuff and you can't fit that over a voice channel. And so that's kind of the forcing function that is, is getting us to uh, NG911. So we have a better way. We'll just put that on the internet. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> no. But seriously, uh, a lot of people hear Next Generation 911, they hear that it's IP based, and they immediately say, oh, you're putting 911 on the internet. How could you be so stupid? Well, first off, no, we're not. That's not the idea. The Almost. Standards... We're not, OK? OK, fine. Yeah. <laughs> Stop trying to make the internet happen, Alex. All right. It's not going to happen. <laughs> So it's going to be over private managed IP networks. It's all hopefully going to be very secure. Um, but as we're going to talk about in a bit, there are some reasons why things have to work differently uh, for life safety systems. So other sort of externalities that, that matter for us, um, carriers are walking away from their legacy TDM infrastructure. They don't want to be in this business anymore because it doesn't make money, it's expensive to maintain, it's highly regulated. So even in places where uh, you know, they are keeping up the copper network, they're no longer keeping up the copper network for the purpose of carrying analog voice. They're actually giving you like a DSL terminal adapter for your house and then spitting the telephone stuff out the back end of that. They're doing the conversion inside the home. Um, and that has real consequences because now that changes the way that the voice, the voice call part of it is being carried even in the wireline world. 
And as I already said, there are lots of different ways that people now want to communicate that, from our perspective, we want to accommodate because we want people to be able to get 911 natively the way they need it. There's even a proceeding right now at the FCC about PSTN Sunset, right? So regardless of whether or not the carriers choose to do this, they're going to be required to do this in a very short-term period of time. So that's why NG911 is very important is because it's the new standard that can sit on top of IP-based networks, which is what we're rolling to, but we have to fix some things. Yeah. Our organization and a few others got together and formed something called the NG911 Now Coalition. And uh, basically our goal, you can find us at ng911now.org. Our goal is to have NG911 rolled out nationwide by the end of the year 2020. That's really aggressive and it's going to be hard, but we're pushing hard with Congress, the FCC, the carriers, everybody to, to try and get that done because we, we need it badly. So what's the purpose for wanting to do this, right? Because now we're starting to transition into a, okay, well, we know we have to move to this new thing because the PSTN's going away, but there are lots of things that we could do to just preserve PSTN functionality on, on an IP network, right? But the thing that's also driving it is a desire for shiny new toys. We want things like dy dynamic location-based routing, which we will very much talk about in just a moment. Uh, we want failover ease and the ability to transfer calls to the appropriate public safety answering point on a, it's hardwired. Yeah, on a really dynamic basis because the telephone's hardwired. Uh, we want to be able to do mobile public safety answering points. We want virtualized public safety answering points. So imagine we have a hurricane and all the public safety answering points are blown away. Okay, cool. So understanding that that happens, then how do you respond? The way you respond is by spinning up a new public safety answering point. But remember that we have this problem with trust in the PSTN. Right, because we're not the phone company anymore. Now we're lots of different organizations who all want equal privileged access. That gets into some really interesting problems. And NG911, while it is absolutely necessary, it is still totally the Jetsons on some level because we haven't quite figured out how to do the thing that we really want to accomplish. So I'm going to talk for just a moment about the i3 architecture. This is done by Nina, big shout out. I3 architecture has basically three different types of components. The first component is uh, the carrier service environment, right? Or rather, the originating service environment. These are the carriers like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, Comcast, everybody else who dials into the emergency services IP network or the EsiNet. That's that cent central big the blue cloud. The big blue cloud on the yeah. screen. J just to be clear, it's, it, it is the carriers. He's absolutely right about that. The cool thing is with NG911, it's no longer just the carriers. That's Right. So if Facebook and WhatsApp want to send emergency traffic to an NG911 system and they're using the IETF standards for how you do stuff like that, they can absolutely do it and it will work fine. Totally. But remember, now we have new service providers who are not traditional telcos who now are able to associate traffic with a 911 environment, right? Like, who's WhatsApp? Who, who knows who they are? Do, do we know? You, well, you all have the app, but have you, have you talked to the CEO of WhatsApp? No, you're not going to do that. So, um, so this gets to an interesting question of like, how do we validate trust end to end, right? Because this is what we're about to exploit. With the the third part of this of this architecture are these legacy and next generation public safety answering points, right? So ultimately, what the duration of this talk is going to focus on is the association between those public safety answering points and that EsiNet, right? That emergency services IP network. So let's talk. I, I, just yeah. real quick, I want to give a shout out. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration operates uh, the National 911 Office, which is it's really unfortunate with, within our government. There is like one person with a handful of contractors yeah. who's and role she's it a is boss. To make, she's awesome, Laurie Flaherty. Uh, they actually put this diagram together. They're they're great for this stuff. Um, so big shout out to NHTSA and the National 911 Office. Thanks, for that. Laurie. <laughs> So let's talk protocols for a minute. So, because this is really what we're going to be exploiting in the next couple of slides. We have this thing called the ESRP, or the Emergency Services Routing Protocol. This is basically a SIP proxy, right? Handles all SIP traffic that's initiated with inside of the EsiNet. The second piece that we have is this emergency call routing function, or the ECRF. This determines the best or most appropriate PSAP. Not, not the nearest. Not necessarily the closest, but the most appropriate, right? So, like, if you're, you know, can, you give a use, can you give a use case about where one wouldn't be the closest so but most perfect appropriate. perfect example of this, if you are uh, standing right near the, the border between two counties, um, one county has its 911 system literally directly across the line within like feet of you, but you're here, the people that respond, the people that are supposed to answer that call are your county's 911 center. It may be farther away. Clear across the state. But it's still the right one because you're inside its service contour, which gets important in a minute. 
So then the last piece we have is the policy routing function, which really defines the non-geographic assets of routing, right? Like, you know, flag these calls, send all these calls to this one public safety answering point, because they have like special analysts or, you know, uh, telecommunicators who are there, who are the 911 call takers, right? Somebody who might be specially trained in some sort of methodology. Um, and then the last one is ICAM, which we all know, Identity Credential Access Management. So these are really the four, the four different pieces of the network that we're gonna interface with. So, What's the trouble with trust? This is a really important piece because what we've done as we've talked about is we took this legacy methodology of trust from the PSTN, we laid it on the IP network. Remember that all calls under all circumstances must reach 911, even if the authentication fails. Everything has to go through. Why? Because if, if, if something happens, we want to make sure that somebody's taken care of. We've got a great quote on this in a second. It, it's just not acceptable to say, we're sorry your certificate is expired. Please hold and bleed to death. You know, that, and, that's and we'll have someone with you in a wait time of five to ten minutes. Um, but the, the interesting part here is what we've built underneath of this model of all calls must go through is a fail working model. And that fail working mode is really important and is what we're about to talk through the exploitation. So this is, I, I'm personally very proud of this. I, 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 this um, I would love to say this was intentional and I hacked DEF CON knowing that someday I would give this talk, but that, that's total BS. Um, but two years ago I asked Bruce Shiner a question about how do we uh, get folks to, uh, how do we drive adoption of secure communications technologies by making sure that access to emergency services, which for mo people experiencing some kinds of emergencies, it, it's really important. You know, if you're being abused, uh, if you, know, you have a medical condition, you don't want other people to know about that. We have to keep up trust. And, and Bruce thought about it for a second and he said, you know, um, uh, it, if there's some reason the PKI doesn't work, if there's some reason the fucking PKI doesn't work, I want to fucking talk to 911. Amen. And I guarantee you everybody feels that way, right? I mean, you don't ever want to hear, we're sorry, the OCSP server is offline, you can't call 911 today. Merp. That, that's, not, that's just not okay. Um, so that has consequences, though. Uh, you know, in military communications, in financial communications, in literally everything else we do, if the authentication fails or, the, or encryption fails, we say don't handle that traffic because it's, you know, we, it, it's not good, we don't want it, it's potentially malicious. In 911, that's not an option for us. We, we don't get that privilege, so we have to work around it. And that has real consequences for uh, vulnerabilities in deployed systems. So we're going to talk through what our methodology was for exploitation of the emergency services IP network, and, and basically that side of the, of the architecture for NG911. So when we wanted to do our research here, we focused on um, not necessarily low-hanging fruit, but the hard-to-solve problem. Because the hard-to-solve problem here is how do we make sure that all calls go through and quite frankly we haven't figured that piece out and that's why we're here because we're going to talk about our exploitation. What we did figure out though is how to use the fail working model to our nefarious advantage. So I'm going to talk through the steps that we took. The first one was we exploited the underlying cryptographic vulnerability in um, the current implementation of the standard, not in the standard itself. We'll talk through that. Uh, two, we got command and control inside of the ESINet. We were able to forge geolocation coordinates for both where our public safety answering point is supposed to be in the world, and thus it's also its inherent service contour, but also where all of your calls are supposed to come from is very different from where we tell the ESINet where they actually come from. Um, we were able to set up a denial of service attack to DOS the other public safety answering points and capture all the failover traffic. So in three different ways, we figured out how to subsume all of the possible traffic so we get all of the calls. So all calls flow to basically my uh, laptop. Important caveat, <laughs> very important caveat. We did not do this in the world, so I'm not going to jail for DEF CON. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> Output was, we did this at a research lab. We went to Texas A&M University to the Internet 2 lab. They were incredibly cool to have us. We're gonna give a huge shout out at the end for them. Uh, but I wanna note that there are some really important things here. This is a lab environment, it's not a production environment. So things are gonna operate differently. They're both neater and cleaner in some areas. They're also way more fucked up in other areas, right? The, the other piece of this though is that 
the, some of this is just the way that the software is currently implemented, and because it's not running in a production environment, some things we were able to do, we don't know if they will fix in production, so we figured out what those really awful things were, like read-write privileges, and uh, privileged escalation, and figure out then how to take those and go back to the vendors to help them make a more yeah. secure solution. And, and I'll just point out there that a lot of this, so there are a lot of NG911 systems that are deployed today. They're, they're sort of transitional. Um, and so some of these things you probably could go and do if there was something attached to those other than like analog voice channels, but there isn't. There's so, not. You know, it, you, it's kind of hard to you know pop certificates over uh, over TDM voice. Yeah. So this is not an O'Day talk. Sorry, guys. So the uh, let's start with our our first step: exploitation of cer of certificates. So NG nine one one uses certificates to assure trust. So they're not just letting people blank fire. Um, there is in the standard a requirement for a certificate authority, but... It's called the PSAP Credentialing Authority, and due to reasons mostly involving money, uh, it doesn't exist yet. Womp womp. Uh, so the, uh, it, while it calls for that certificate authority, they're actually today just using self-signed certificates. <laughs> Boom. So uh, here's the problem with self-signed certificates. Uh, you can do easy certificate exploitation. So let's walk through the methodology. So we start by getting on the wire with uh, SSL strip, SIP Vicious, uh, Wireshark, and a few other tools. We see the cert as it floats by on the wire. We pull it down, we malform it, and as you'll see in line six, uh, the certificate says maximum ponage. That's that really interesting. Right. No way that's auto-generated. <laughs> so we now supply our self-signed certificate to our own virtual public safety answering point, right? So we have access to a virtual one because Texas A&M was cool enough to give us one, but you can also go out and get them because they exist because we want emergency response to be dynamic. So we have this public safety answering point. We have our own certificate. We have all the drivers. We've got all the ports correctly configured. We associate it with a network. and. What happens next? Boom goes the dynamite. We're now authenticated to the emergency services IP network or the EziNet in equal privilege to everybody else. It accepts our certificate and now we're on and what happens? SIP sessions start moving because it has load balancers that are inherent in the network. We don't have to do anything but provide the network our base geolocation coordinates to start getting traffic. So we've invented a bullshit PSAP. We've supplied, supplied the EziNet with a bullshit certificate and we already start capturing 911 calls. But after we do this, because I'm a special brand of interesting person, I wanted to do two different types of geolocation attacks. The first one is I wanted to see if I could move my PSAP. So why would I want to do that? Uh, so I've got this rogue, you know, it's like a rogue base station attack, basically. You want to put the victim in geolocation to your infrastructure. So I moved my infrastructure to be in geolocation of whatever I wanted. So in this circumstance, right, the, the ESRP uses this function called LOST, the location and service translation, and it requires uh, the uh, ECRF, uh, sorry, to use the location data interface to figure out where I actually am. Do you want so, yeah, and the cool thing about this is, like, it, it, NG911 is designed using these, uh, like, awesome IETF standards track uh, things, like uh, uh, Lost and Held um, and uh, devices called Forest Guides that, that make it possible for your gadgetry to figure out where you are, for the network to figure out where you are, and then to communicate that information, uh, we hope, securely to an NG911 system. Um, they use, for the, for the part we're talking about here, though, they also use something called GIS, Geospatial Information Systems, um, to define the service contours of 911 centers. To That's say, right. This is all of the calls within this polygon go to this center, and here's the IP address of its uh, border controller. So we switched our service contour to move from Texas to Bally's Paris Hotel giving DEF CON its very first PSAP. So <laughs> all, calls in, all calls in our part of Texas, where we actually are, are now received in DEF CON basically by my laptop. Not, not particularly cool. The other part, though, of this attack, and this is the, in, the other interesting part, is we were able to forge the geolocation of inbound calls. So it's one thing to change the geolocation of the public safety answering point. It's another thing to write a short script and run it on top of the EziNet that says put all inbound calls into a 10-meter radius of, my, of the middle of my
my service contour. So we so they grab, to us. We, they have nowhere else to go. We grab all traffic, even if we're not able to get to this level of exploitation, right? Even if we, if for some reason there's something on the network that senses that's, that's bullshit, that's not your geolocation, you're not supposed to be the correct PSAP, right? It doesn't matter, because on the other side, if we're able to attach at all, we can direct all the calls to us anyway. In fact, if we wanted to, we could selectively, uh, we, we could basically man in the middle uh, your PIDA flow, position information, data format, location object. That's the thing that the location information server sends into the 911 center to say, here's where the caller is. Yep. Um, we could actually man in the middle of that, alter it, and then the forest guides will tell uh, uh, your carrier network to send the call somewhere else, basically somewhere of our choosing. Um, and that's, we, we, didn't, we, we didn't write that up here, but that, that's certainly another way you could do this very simply because the PIDA flows are not signed. Yeah. The carrier doesn't have to sign that to say this person is actually where I assert that they are. Or you could look for a single phone number of an inbound caller. A single phone number of an inbound caller, you can track and identify an actual individual and you can make their call, not all calls, just that one call, go to the public safety answering point you want. Anybody see Ocean's Eleven? Because it was filmed here in Vegas. I mean, that, that <laughs> essentially happened. They had to like physically tap something to do that yep. uh, because of the nature of the 911 network, but that wouldn't be required. Right. This. You could just say, okay, any 911 calls from within, uh, I think it was the MGM Grand in yep. that case, please bring those to us. Totally. So not having Brad Pitt and George Clooney at hand, we also had to figure out a failover vulnerability. So when we talk about this fail working model that we discussed previously with all calls must go through, we're going to show two use cases, the way it's supposed to work and then the way we made it work. So when we did the failover vulnerability, we have this, uh, you know, basically public safety answering point. So this is the NG911 function running on top of the EZNet. You have a good public safety answering point. This is like the legit good dudes. They're supposed to be there. They start connecting, right? They exchange their certificates. They're all copacetic. They start getting SIP traffic. We have another good public safety answering point, right? Because we have multiple public safety answering points in a state. Because these are the 911 call centers, so there's like 50 or whatever. Um, you know, sorry for being a little flippant about the number, but you know, it depends on the state. And so, but what happens if we now sever this line of communication? Well, if they drop the session, the good PSAP goes away and it fails over to the other good PSAP, right? That's good, we want that to happen. In a hurricane, one public safety answering point gets knocked out, they lose power, something happens, it rolls over, calls get balanced, all calls still go through. But what's the way that, the other way that this could work? Well. We use this attack called Voiper. Straight got it off GitHub. I'm not going to invent like I wrote the code. Uh, but so we use Voiper attack to go after the quality of service of the SIP connection between this bot, this cloud, ooh, the cloud, and the good PSAP, right? So we have the public safety answering point in our, just like we did in our last one. And it connects over here, but then we also have our evil PSAP. Ooh. And so our evil PSAP uh, initiates a, uh, a SIP attack using Voiper against the quality of service of that connectivity between the NG911 function on the EZNet and the good PSAP. And so when it starts doing that, what we're able to do is turn that good PSAP, because we're cutting off its line of communication because we're fucking with QoS, right, into a sad PSAP. And now that we have our sad PSAP, we get all the traffic. All your 911 calls are belong to us. Boom. <laughs> so why would we do this? Right? It's cool to be able to do this in a lab, but wh why is this actually important? Beyond the fact that we're looking to bring people into the security research field on this. Well, it's important to understand who the threat actors for these things would be. So, I mean, it's one thing to be able to like invent some cool vulnerability, but like if no one's going to use it, then so what? Well, <laughs> Ultimate reality here is that this is the tomfoolery and trickery of the criminal element, right? You get them to look the other direction, then you punch them in the neck. And the way that we do that here is we think through a circumstance in which you would have someone or a group of people who would work, for example, in the criminal element, like organized crime um, or others, who would want to be able to do things like rob a bank, capture all the 911 calls from people saying the bank's being robbed, and just basically move them to dev null. And at the, at the end of what we've done here, basically is we figured out how people would choose to use 911 as a veneer, right? The comfort that people get when they call 911 and take that availability away from them. And you could easily imagine people wanting to do this in multiple fields. Um, and because basically what we've done is we've used the system redundancy against the network itself, we have been able to express the same type of tactics, techniques, and procedures that we would expect from criminal element. 
And, and I'll point out, let me, let me give you a kind of a hypothetical example of like where and why this could matter. So one of the big like sexy use cases for NG911, uh, if, you, if you remember the Christmas Day bombing attack from New York City, um, that was stopped because someone called 911 and they said there's this creepy looking white van, here's the license plate, blah, blah, blah. That's great, that works, creepy looking white van, it's a Ford license plate, et cetera. It would be much better for us in the public safety community if the person making that 911 call could instead simply snap a picture of the creepy looking white van That's and right. send that to us so that we can then decide, okay, is this relevant? Yes, great, push it out to the cops on the street, go after this creepy looking white van. Because that stops, uh, you know, I had a buddy that got you know, yanked out of his truck and, and thrown to the ground with you know, guns to his head basically because he was driving a truck that looked like one of an armed robber. Um, you know, with photographs, it's, that, it's harder for that to happen. Um, hopefully, but somebody could easily, in a circumstance like that, alter uh, that information. If they were lurking, the, the attacker could have said, okay, I see that photograph coming across the wire. Let's make the white van a uh, red Tercel. Yeah. So, I mean, you can fool with the integrity and availability of these systems, but what's important to understand is it's not just the 911 network. It's a critical infrastructure network. Like, these are things that people use that we all pay money for that's supposed to work that we're supposed to be able to rely on, and that's why you have to do vulnerability research in these areas. But not all is lost. There are mitigations. Trey? Yes. So um, we talked earlier, my organization, we're the standards developers, and the great thing is we do actually have uh, a small number of very dedicated, very knowledgeable people um, on uh, uh, IP networking and uh, IETF standards and, and security to some extent, although that's probably our biggest limitation right now. Um, they came up uh, with, with two things, both the I3 standard, that's the standard for how you do NG911. Um, it has tons of security related uh, 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 functional entities and protocols and so forth baked in. The border control functions uh, do special yep. things, the routing proxies do things, you know, we mark suspicious traffic, all that sort of stuff. Um, but then on top of that, they actually published another standard called NGSEC. That's the security standard for NG911. I will tell you it is good, it's not great, it's not done. It, it is a wonderful document as it is, yep. but there are tons of things that the public safety community has not yet thought about to put in there because we've never had intrusion detection before. It, what are you going to detect that the, the the pizza guy called instead of you know a 911 call that 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 doesn't help. Um, we've never had a lot of these these security related things that we're going to have to have now, and so just knowing about it to enough to put it in a document is like step one right. for, for our community. It's very important. Um, we, we have the ability, as I said, in the standard to mark unauthenticated traffic as suspicious. Um, and now with some of the recent rule changes by the FCC, we should have uh, much better capability to use reputation scoring for phone numbers and things like that to make decisions about, okay, do we think this is likely to be a nefarious call uh, from the media standpoint? Um, I, I, we mentioned the PSAP credentialing authority, the special CA. <laughs> Um, that does not exist yet, but uh, there is an RFP being put together for that, and I looked at uh, what I hope and pray will be the final version that I have to edit um, last week, and so it'll be about another two months, I think, before the, the, an RFP goes out for the CA, which is a good thing, but we also still have to figure out how to pay for it, because that, you know, in, in the public sector, everyone is so flush with cash that they just, you know, have tons of it lying around. Um, not really. Depends on which state, but... Yeah. Not really. <laughs> um, and, and for now, there's this sort of inherent mitigation, which is that even though most of the carrier networks are now natively IP, SIP, you know, VoIP, basically, um, and even though there are NG911 systems out there that are natively IP and SIP, in the middle, everything is getting converted to TDM to go over like one set of trunks and use one particular switch so that it can still get to the place where it's just going to be turned right back into what it was to start with. Um, which is not terribly efficient, but it is sort of a security protection because turning your traffic into TDM first like breaks a lot of the stuff that we talk about here because the, none of the IP stuff actually makes it out the other end. Plus, even if we wanted to get away from the technical side of things, right, like if you're a public safety answering point and you normally get like 80 calls in an hour and you get no calls for like three hours, you can probably start to imagine that there's something up, right? So there's like, if you're just a smart person, you'll figure out that you're under attack depending on what the nature of the attack attack is, and you can then contact your systems administrator on line seven. Uh, or you could contact any, pe any of the people who run the emergency services network, and they can begin doing some sort of analysis or forensics to determine these things. So these are bad things that absolutely 100% can happen today, but we have a reasonable expectation that by getting people who are smart together in a room and working through it, that we'll get there. 
Also, and that the process you just talked about can be automated. Actually, there are right. people right now looking at. Um, it, it, so it turns out the 911 call is exceptionally uh, regular. Uh, we see it uh, beautifully in terms of like the flow by time of day, day of week, etc. Um, and so you can start to automate things like around. Uh, okay, am I getting far more calls or far fewer calls than I should reasonably expect? Standard at this time? deviation. Then, yeah. <laughs> so we'll leave. Oh, sorry. I, I, I got a couple. A couple more mitigations here. Um, first off, we could start having. We talked earlier that the location objects are not signed. We should absolutely be signing those, um, and that's actually going to be part of a future revision to the standard. We think. Yep. Um, same thing with uh, PSAP service contours. Those should be signed as well once the CA exists. Um, we can start to do some things like low-level sanity checking. We can say if the GPS chip in the cell phone says it's in Texas um, and it's showing the call is being uh, uh, presented at a, uh, a PSAP in Las Vegas, well, okay, there's a mismatch there and we should find out why that's happening unless we intended it to. Um, and we can also do things like we can say um, uh, if this is attached to a cable modem that's in Kansas, then it, the call should not be showing up at a PSAP that's in Florida. So we, we can start to do some of the database stuff that we do today to kind of sanity check some of this. Also, implementing TLS for all the held lookups is really important. Go again, RFC. That depends on, uh, uh, depends on the CA again. So we'll leave you guys with a couple of parting shots. Um, as we said before, it's really vital that 911 always work for everyone because lives really are at stake. Um, and there's a lot of work left to be done to make sure that all of these things are secure to start with and become even more secure down the line. So one of the big reasons that, that we uh, uh, put into present this year was to, to basically put out a call for help to say, our community in public safety, we're not as unfriendly as we seem sometimes. We desperately need the folks in this room um, to, to be part of the community. And one of the ways you can do that is by joining us at dev.nina.org. That's our standards development uh, portal. For those of you who have used Covey before, it's a, it's a Covey site. Um, and uh, we would love to have you, if you want to actively participate, that's where to sign up. It's, it's, like, it's a little scary given the pervasive nature of 911 that this is probably the largest group of security professionals that's ever been involved at all in this type of security research, right? Like, that, that should scare people, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's not a good idea that two knuckleheads are the guys who are leading research on this. Um, and so we'd ask you to do, if you're interested in this, if you have like a persistent interest in NGSEC and 911 security, tonight at 4 p.m. at Burgers, we're gonna be holding a meetup uh, where uh, I will personally pay for one round of drinks for half of you, depending on the number of people who show up. Uh, <laughs> so come for the beer and the jokes and the conversation. But we want to start a community of people who actually get involved in research on this. You can make a legit difference, and we're here to support for that. Also, shameless self-promotion, we will have uh, the first ever 911 uh, security conference this October. It's going to be in Columbus, Ohio, that garden spot. Um, and uh, we'll have at least four or 500 uh, uh, security pros or, or mainly public safety pros. We're gonna be talking through some of these issues, so we'd love to have uh, anybody there that can join us. So shout out to our team. We had a couple of people who helped us out. Tom Blackard with Team Secure Set, Jake Nelson with Team Secure Set, and with Team Texas A&M University, uh, Walt Magnuson, and this really awesome little network nerd, uh, Derek Ladd, who just made it hop. So cheers to them. And so I, now. I have one personal shout out. Yeah, please. Not on the trip. So, um, Two years ago, I came here as a total noob, as a fucking lawyer, as someone who had no business at all being at DEF CON, and the guys back here from QueerCon brought me in. They are my family now. They are wonderful. These badges are the coolest thing you will ever see at DEF CON. Right on. Big hands. So thank you to you guys for getting me up here. So now's the dangerous part of the talk. We open to comments, prayer requests, song dedications, but... No smug assertions of InfoSec superiority. Amen. Amen. So there should be microphones, I think, someplace. There's one down here, one over there someplace. Hello. Um, since the HIPAA standard actually deals with 911 and emergency centers where a patient cannot die simply because your computers aren't up, uh, I was wondering how much have you actually looked at, and it's really scary if you actually consider uh, um, emergency room security an improvement, but actually it might be. How much of that standard have you actually looked at versus trying to reinvent the wheel? So um, HIPAA applies in some very specific and relatively narrow circumstances. There are certain types of information 
in certain types of transit that have to be protected certain ways. Um, the objective of the I-3 and NG sex specs was to make sure that that was at least a minimum um, so that we were not, uh, uh, we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, a lot of that should be baked in. Now, personally, because our organization just this past year, we did the first ever NIST gap assessment uh, of a 911 center. And uh, what we found was, frankly, somewhat terrifying um, because uh, it looked like basically a house with no windows and no doors and maybe only part of a roof that was mostly on fire. Um, and so uh, we're a little bit scared about where that is. Um, we have had just this year about six or eight hit with ransomware, and thankfully those guys were just interested in getting paid, but they could have equally been interested in taking people's data. Um, and so we're, we're very conscious of the need to protect uh, sensitive health information. Well, no, I, I was thinking at a more of a strategic level here for a second because I've been making the case like the, like the risk management case with, with, with a doctor. I mean, his risk management case is you're not going to die in 15 minutes. We're fine. What's the risk? Okay. And the information security case says, okay, they're not going to die in 15 minutes. Why would you spend $1,000 on security versus a heart monitor? Okay. Uh, and that's the risk management case, really, that you're facing, which is... So we should absolutely talk about that, but I okay. want to get another... So catch up with us at 4 o'clock at Burgers, and we will definitely talk about that. Who's next? This guy. I've got a question prefaced with an explanation for you. Go for it. Uh, my question is, how robust is the load uh, distribution and uh, PSAP spin-up process. How what was it? How robust is it in yeah. NG911? And the reason that I'm asking that question is that uh, there was a fantastic 101 on Thursday regarding uh, virtual PBX switch, uh, SIP access, and being able to spam a phone number with a shitload of phone calls. So if, say, a person who wants to cause chaos in a certain town could buy 500 SIP lines and then spam 10,000 calls an so, hour. So never mind NG911 at all. Forget that that exists for a second. We're just in today's E911 world. The average 911 center has a grand total of five or six inbound trunks. You pop one enterprise call manager at a small business, not even a medium business, yep. you can overload a region. Um, easily, and that is, the, and we don't have any way to defend against that. Like, there's no, you know, it, it's difficult and terrifying, and, and so, I, you know, we, we don't know what to do about that. Yet. And I, I'd also say, don't if, do that. So if you go, if you, yeah, right. So and remember, this is a lab environment, but uh, computationally, uh, to spin up a, a virtual PSAP, so that took that took about an hour and a half to get that to get that set. Um, but like that thing eats like a hog, right? So if you throw enough traffic at it, not just from like a, a telecom denial of service perspective, but if you make that thing eat enough, it's gonna it's gonna take itself down. So we had to be really careful about our implementation. I'll be honest, I dosed myself twice, right? Like you're, it's gonna happen. Um, so yeah, there, it's not as robust as it needs to be. Is there a way to mitigate that on your guys' checklist? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, th there are some, and, and there have been attacks, by the way. People have DOSed PSAPs uh, over their yeah. admin lines. Um, international SIP gateway exchanges uh, have, have really uh, messed, up, messed with them. Go for it. Uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, the database that you mentioned earlier that has all the uh, addresses. Is Location that, information server. Yeah. Oh. Is in there NG or in E? Is it one, one database, or does every telephone company have their own database? Is it proprietary? Uh, so yeah. it, de it depends on which one you're talking about. If you're talking about in the E911 world, can you scroll back yeah. to that while I talk? Um, in the E911 world, th there's a master street address guide in each town, right. basically. There is a uh, selective routing database and an alley automatic location identification database so who, in theory who, for each carrier, but in practice, they're all outsourced to about three companies. Yeah. So the, the data is proprietary or? Yes, okay. for now. Uh, my second question is, Regarding the uh, NCS GET system, are they yep. having uh, similar problems in transitioning? Do they use as, as you net? So funny story, actually, we used to work at DHS in the component that runs WPS and GETs. And, um, Thanks for knowing about it. You're the yeah, guy. Yeah. yeah. You're the one. Um, they, they are actually working now on next generation GETs and WPS. I don't know where it is because I've been out of that now for six years, but yeah, that, that's definitely happening. You might consider pen testing that too. Yeah, that I mean, uh, it still uses underlying compromise, you know, like infrastructure, right, like SS7 um, and a lot of other infrastructure. So NGN GETs is not as secure as you might believe it to be because it's not TDM based. Uh, so most of this is new to me. Um, is any of this 911 stuff crossover with the Amber Alert system? No. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> no. 
So I will say excellent talk. Um, you mentioned funds are a major issue in a severely aging infrastructure, especially in some of the more rural areas in yes, Texas sir. as well. Um, that being said, I'm a, self, I'm a firefighter and first responder, so I have a unique um, viewpoint, rather, dealing with city management for funds, not only for fire gear, but everything else. Yes, sir. You start talking about a lot of this stuff to city and police and everybody else, they're going to start looking like, you know, your heretic and want to burn you. So how, do yes. you, how are you going to approach that? With Very them? carefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, that, that, that is like, that's the biggest thing for our organization, being the 911 Association. We just decided, you know what, burn us at the stake if you want. We are going to talk about this until it's all fixed. Yeah. Okay. Like, dude, this has to happen for police, fire, EMS, civil servants, also just people, right? Just everybody else. Like, my nightmare scenario is somebody screws the geolocation coordinates up, and they send your guys into a building that's a chem fire instead of a regular fire, right? That's, that's a clusterfuck, so this yeah. has to get taken care of. Okay. Thank you, guys. You've been wonderful. Thank you. you guys rock.